also distributed agile team today. We are on day two of the conference. Uh, I'll Welcome back. My name is Ravi Kumar. Uh, uh, we uh, team as a team chair for also distributed agile. Uh, today we are extremely privileged to have Todd Little amongst us to start off the proceedings for the day the keynote. I'll come back after the keynote uh, to share with you all few of the logistics, key information about the conference, and then we'll break for 15 minutes when the full conference starts off. All right. Thanks very much. With no further ado, Todd Little. How's the sound? Sounds okay? You hear me all right? All right, excellent. Well, thanks. Uh, welcome this morning. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, I've just joined up with a new company, uh, IHS Global, uh, as the Vice President of Development, uh, having come from uh, Landmark Graphics and Halliburton, where I had done uh, a long career in product development. I've had an opportunity here to join uh, with our local office in Bangalore to see some excitement going on. So. Had a lot of experience with uh, offshore development, with uh, working with teams in India, working with teams around the globe. So first of all, uh, since this is, is uh, India, I figured I'd have to have at least a, some sort of pseudo uh, Bollywood reference. So we'll start with this. Are you Mr. Toad? Todd. Puru. 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 Todd. Mr. Toad. Toad. Mr. Toad. 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 Mr. 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 Toad. 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 Mr. Toad. 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 So sorry for the confusion. So I have I have a secret desire to be a Bollywood actor. So I'd like all of you to join and help me and say, Good morning, Mr. Toad. Right? Good morning. Okay, thank you, thank you. So not only have I completed my desire to be a Bollywood actor, um, but since you've bastardized my name, that gives me permission to mispronounce all of your names because it, it's not out of desire, it's just it's very difficult for us. So anyway, very good, thanks. Um, as I've said, I've had a lot of experience with global teams uh, from my time back at Halliburton. Uh, Halliburton Landmark grew through acquisitions uh, and I had a lot of uh, experience with my teams were scattered around predominantly North America through energy capitals in Houston, uh, Denver, Calgary, as well as internationally in Europe. Uh, over time, uh, we got very active in, in uh, uh, expanding that through uh, outsourcing providers uh, throughout the globe. Uh, and we've worked with many, I've worked over a period of about 15 years with a number of different uh, uh, offshore vendors uh, in India, uh, Ukraine, and uh, Romania, as well as Vietnam. Uh, now that I've joined IHS, it's got a similar footprint. I'm, my focus is in the energy sector within IHS. So again, we have uh, naturally Houston, Denver, and Calgary, uh, internationally in, in uh, offices in Europe, as well as uh, we do have a, a, the local center here in Bangalore, uh, as well as uh, uh, a number of partners as well uh, in uh, Chennai and Hyderabad. So various experience dealing with globally distributed teams. I'm going to give you a couple, uh, one particular case study uh, that I've worked with and then go into some of the insights that I've had over the years dealing with uh, globally distributed teams. So this first case study that I'm going to talk about uh, is one where I had a particular passion. My career I started at Exxon as uh, my background's a chemical engineer. Uh, I migrated into petroleum engineering. I worked for Exxon, then started work uh, for a very small startup company, J.S. Nolan Associates, that was some, uh, uh, I was the fifth, fifth employee of that company. Uh, really passionate about reservoir simulation, doing development in that area. Uh, love the engineering, love the software, love the mathematics associated with it. What we do in reservoir simulation is we take all the data, we collect all the data, historical data from reservoirs, historical data, production data, and we feed it into a big model, big, we create a big mathematical model of what the Earth looks like, and then we simulate the future production and the behavior of the reservoir going forward 10, 15, 30, maybe even 100 years forward to figure out what's production going to look like, what is the future. Very valuable information for oil companies in order to do, to do future planning. So this is an example here of, of a, just a visual representation. This is an oil reservoir. The bottom is the water on the bottom, the oil's in the middle, and we have gas in the, at the top. And over time, the gas will expand, the water will come in, 
and the oil will be depleted. So just a high level view of, of what, uh, what we're doing in this particular situation. So from a system workflow perspective, um, we do, it, it's a very numerically intensive operation. That's why we use a, utilize a high performance cluster in the back end. Uh, on top of that high performance cluster, we've got loosely coupled uh, to a, a user interface, a graphical pre-processing interface, as well as a graphical post-processing 3D visualization uh, operation, as you, you saw the movie there. So there are some computing challenges and, and uh, software challenges associated with uh, this, this problem. First of all, a few people think it's a little complicated. Um, I don't know, this is the simplified version, so, but uh, that's the type of thing we're solving. And we're solving that equation not just once, but over millions of cells. So we, we break the reservoir up into millions of cells, and we're solving this into millions of cells, uh, which creates essentially a, a million by million matrix. And then we solve that problem thousands of times because we're predicting that into the future. So it is very computationally intensive. Um, as you say, that's, that's sort of the, the, the large scale matrix that we're, we're solving. Uh, some simulations that we do, even though we're on high performance computing, the good thing about high performance computing is it does a lot of computing really fast. The problem with, is, with engineers is they like to make bigger and bigger problems. So uh, simulations often take hours, sometimes days. I even had a customer who said he measured his simulations in haircuts. When the haircut was done, that's when the simulation job was, uh, the haircut was ready, that's when the simulation job was done, ready to make the next one. Um, another challenge we have is our testers are petroleum engineers. We need them to be petroleum engineers. We need to be people, people that understand the domain. Uh, they aren't test automation specialists, so that was one of the challenges we had with most of our team. And uh, another challenge we have is numerical simulations of approximations. So we're doing lots and lots of approximations, uh, and due to that, we're subject to a lot of roundup problems. Uh, perturbation differences. Um, it's, a, it's something that means unit testing isn't necessarily sufficient. You've got to do, or in fact, it, it, sometimes unit testing gives you false information, and the real challenges are solving the integration solution. So if you look at some of our problems that we were facing at the time, we were finding too many defects during beta testing. We were relying too heavily on back-end testing, uh, not getting sufficient coverage early. Our tests were taking a long time. At the time, there was a global shortage of petroleum engineers. Um, the case study I'm going through, ironically, is one where, uh, so we had a global shortage of petroleum engineers. We tried taking this, uh, working with an offshore vendor in India, and it just didn't work. And it really, the reason it didn't work was we couldn't find petroleum engineers that were um, uh, available to help, and that, that domain was so critical. So we ended up uh, pulling it back from, from the Indian vendor and uh, ending up going to to other vendors, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Again, I said our testers don't have the automation skills. Um, we didn't have a lot of unit tests, but we did have some, a very good uh, collection of uh, develop, developer level tests. Uh, and I said the last thing, uh, approximation breaks abstraction. So this is a case where unit tests aren't sufficient. You really need to have uh, a good set of, until you, until you put this whole series of, li of linear equations together and solve the big problem, that's where you, you really pull together the challenges. The mathematics may be pure, but the time you pull it into a computational environment, uh, you've got challenges that, that need to be dealt with. So some of the testing problems are similar to uh, other problems we have. This is a little, little scenario here. Uh, yeah, before Bollywood, there was Hollywood, and in the age of Hollywood, one of our classics is The Wizard of Oz. So this is sort of the software story through The Wizard of Oz. So we start with the project kickoff, and we have little Dorothy saying, when will we get the requirements? All in good time. My little pretty, all in good time. But I guess it doesn't matter anyway. Just give me your estimates by this afternoon. The team binds together. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'll have to give the matter a little thought. Go away and come back tomorrow. No, we need something today. Nobody's ever heard this, have they? Okay, then it'll take two years. No, we need it sooner. Doesn't anybody believe me? I already promised the customer it'll be out in six months. You're a very bad man. Uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. The developer gets together and says, 
I may not come out alive, but I'm going in there. He's just about got it under control. And then what happens? Reorganizations. Great and powerful Oz has got mad as well in hand. My, people come and go so quickly here. And then they finally persevere. They're almost done. And then what happens? They push it off to testing. <laughs> Going so soon? I wouldn't hear of it. Why, my little party, just beginning. So that's the type of problem we were hitting. We were hitting that back-end testing, taking too much, too much time, for, uh, getting us into too much trouble at the end. Um, from that, I came across this paper by Lankow. Uh, and I love this paper, Estimating Agile Software Project Effort and Agile or an Empirical Study. And I love it for three reasons. <laughs> First reason, she references some of my research work. So, I mean, that's great and uh, awesome on its own, right? The second is she basically uh, confirms what I'd found in my research. So that's even a second awesome. You know. But the third reason, and the reason I really like this paper, is because she, did a, she did, took it a, a little bit further, and she compared the estimation accuracy in feature estimation compared with the estimation accuracy in dealing with defects and bugs. And the conclusion, which is not too surprising, but I don't think we think about it this way, is that there's twice as much uncertainty in trying to estimate defects. So what does that tell us when we put too much testing at the back end? We've pushed so much uncertainty at the end. So we've made much more uncertainty at the end than we want. So it's all the more reason we've got to uh, find and, and uh, preferably not introduce the defects in the first place, but to the extent that we are introducing defects, we've got to find them early, as find them as early as possible to remove that uncertainty. So some coming back from, you know, we had these problems, but we had a lot of strengths too. Uh, we had an experienced and committed team. They were passionate about the domain. A lot of them were, were uh, uh, PhDs in petroleum engineering, had been working in the industry for a long time. They really knew the product. They really knew the domain. Uh, they had a good collection of lightweight integration tests. The developers had a great discipline about building new tests, doing lightweight integration tests uh, that would cover superficial, we cover the, the integration at a, at a very lightweight level. So that was really good. So they were, were doing that and they were keeping from introducing too many defects, but the challenge was finding when we dealt with the really complicated customer data, that's when the, we were hitting some challenges. Um, we had actually a collaborative uh, relationship with our customers, meeting with customers uh, regularly, uh, weekly in many cases. We had a great product manager, man, manager and management team that was working with the team. Uh, because of our relationships with customers, we had access to challenging data. So the really gnarly problems, we had access to them. Now they were hard, which, and they took a long time to run. Uh, but we had access, which was good, we could find it. And we also had a willingness to invest. This is one of the challenges with a lot of outsourcing, offshoring out activity, is it's done truly, it's done specifically as a cost-saving method, or a cost-saving approach, where we're reducing the team. In this case, we were keeping the, whole, the core team whole and we were looking to invest more in order to um, uh, improve our quality. So that's a big, big shift, and I think that, that helped our success quite a bit. So our proposed solution, first we wanted to understand what our challenges were, uh, understand our current testing strategy and look to fill some gaps. Uh, we wanted to augment the team with global skills, the global teams, and we wanted to find specific partners that had the skills we needed. As I said, we started this first with working with an Indian vendor. It didn't work because they just couldn't find the, t the talent that we needed. Uh, we happened to uh, latch on to a Romania partner. He was a, a uh, petroleum engineering professor, had a team of software engineers that would work with him so he could get the type of petroleum engineers and software developers that we needed. So that was a nice thing. We didn't need a lot of them, but we needed that skill. And then we also worked with a company in Vietnam that happened to have very specific, and that's one thing they did, they only did one thing, and that was test automation. And we really liked their approach, their methodology, that, and, and the tools that they had for test automation. And it was such that they didn't have to have the reservoir engineering domain in order to, to do the automation. We could provide that, and they could do the, the automation specialty. So if we look back at our system workflow, the nice thing we also had going for us was that we could decouple. We had a loosely coupled environment, so we could spend a lot of effort on the high performance cluster. This was the real critical place where if something was wrong, we needed to know about it. It was also the hardest part to test in one sense, because, well, it was the most complex to test, but this is where the business 
the, really the business mattered. If this got wrong, it was a big issue. If we had some errors in the other places that wasn't necessarily as critical, we had to get the uh, simulations right. But we also wanted to have uh, improve our, our testing of the overall system, uh, at the, usually at the GUI level for the user interface and the, and the graphical pre, pre and post processing. So at a high level from our test automation workflow, you know, we started with some inputs, we simulated results, result, you know, get some outputs, compare that against the baseline. And the key part for us was this difference engine. So we had to develop a difference engine because of the, the nature of the approximation that we're doing. We had to have a very intelligent differencing engine that didn't tell us whether we got the same results. It told us whether we got, within engineering accuracy, a result that mattered. So uh, there was some, some time spent over a number of years in, in uh, developing this difference engine, which we happened to have available to us. So that was, we just needed to be able to um, run more and more data, data through it in order to, to increase our coverage. So when we looked at what we had in play, uh, we mapped it out against complexity of tests and breadth of coverage of these tests. And so the good discipline we had, the developers test every check-in, they were running through their test suite, uh, very, ran very quickly, and covered good, good breadth of coverage, but not very complex. I mean, lightweight, not quite, I mean, a little bit more than unit test, but not sufficiently to, to test the types of really complex problems that break some of the, uh, the challenges with simulation. We also had a really good collection of uh, smoke tests. These were being run manually. Uh, we've initially, this was done with our, our team in India. We transferred that over to the Romania team, and they were running that manually. And then we had the, uh, the customer models. These are the really complicated ones, and these were the ones which, even though we were running on a high-performance cluster, were taking uh, upwards of a week to run. So they were finding a really narrow, the, the nasty problems, but they were taking a long time to run. So when we anal analyzed this, we concluded We've got this gap between the customer models, which are finding some of the complicated problems, and the developer tests, which are catching the simple problems and keeping us from introducing too many new problems, but they're not catching the, the, the really nasty problems. And we also had smoke tests that were being manual, and we were looking to see what could we do to automate that, to possibly you know, do it faster, as well as uh, increase our coverage. So our conclusion, was, this is where we moved to, we developed a new set of synthetic data that, that captured some of the complexity of the customer data, uh, but kept some of the breadth of the developer tests, and something that we were able to make sure we could run on a nightly basis. We wanted to have that nightly validation that was a little bit more complex than the developer tests. So it was an investment in building those, those data sets. And they had to be synthetic because we were working with um, remote teams that wouldn't have access to some of the customer data. And then we spent time to automate the GUI test to put more effort into uh, First of automating the additional smoke test, and then that enabled us to build more and more uh, smoke tests that were uh, to expand the coverage of those tests. So over time, we essentially, uh, in, this was between 2009 and 2010, we just were continually adding to our overall coverage that we're able to uh, uh, cover within, within our team. So, oops. So if we look at, at the, the global distribution, it was about 40 people, I think, overall that we had on the, on the team, um, most of it with our core center in Houston. But we had uh, three developers, three petroleum engineer testers that were in um, Bucharest. And then we had uh, four automation testers uh, in Logic Gear in, in Ho Chi Minh City. And how this worked was that the, I mean, our team in Houston would do a lot of the work. We'd also, because we had very strong uh, domain experience in Romania, they could do both the smoke tests as well as develop new tests. And it was key that they were able to, to develop new tests because between the engineers in Houston and those in, in uh, Bucharest, then they would do, um, operate by communicating through Camtasia videos and then the automation specialists in Vietnam would review those, those uh, videos and then create the, the automation tests and, and decompose it using uh, what we used uh, action-based testing, which is a keyword and abstraction model to keep the automation test from being too brittle. It worked very well. Uh, so working with the partners, uh, it worked really well with, with our Romanian team because the, 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 the owner of the company, he was a professor of petroleum simulation, so it perfect fit for us. Uh, I also joke with him that he was a benevolent dictator. Um, his team loved him, but he was really key on delivery. He was focused on delivery, so he would, he would you know, drill it in that delivery was important, and uh, so it worked very well. 
And, and I think the other thing that worked very well here was that we communicated in the language of reservoir simulation. Having that rich domain knowledge made communication so at the level we could communicate at a very high level and they got it immediately. That was key. It was a hard, that was one of the huge problems we had dealing with, with some other vendors. Our, our Vietnam team, um, with the, the, uh, they were specialized in this action-based testing and automation testing. The communication, like I said, was with Camtasia videos, and that communication was in, essentially in the language of uh, uh, automation testing. We were doing that, they were returning back with the automation test and the results. So it had really good communication across the board. Uh, the bottom line, if we compare the prior year, 2009 versus uh, 2010, in 2009 we were finding a lot of defects in beta. Uh, 222, and, and as a result of finding so many issues in beta, it meant that we could only fix so many of them. Now we, we, shipped, we ended up shipping with around 100 defects. They weren't serious defects. They were things that didn't really impact the business problem that we were solving. But there were def defects nonetheless. We really didn't want them in there. But uh, you know, it was good enough to ship. It was good enough to provide value to our customers. The shift of this, when, when we uh, put this additional effort in, uh, significantly lower uh, defect finds in beta which by the, just by the fact of having fewer of them in beta, it meant we could fix almost all of them. We resulted fixing um, all but three, and that's because some of them were very high risk, some of them were of the type that we weren't actually sure they, they really were defects, but um, we classified them as, as such nonetheless. But the big difference, we had a 97% reduction in uh, defects, that we, known defects at the time of ship. So I, I feel a huge improvement to this by, by really focusing on things and then leveraging, leveraging the talent that we had. So let's see what's. So what I really wanted to go into now, after the result of that, is is where, you know, given that I've I've had experience dealing with uh, distributed and offshore teams, what are some of the overall lessons learned, both from this case as well as from dealing with with a number of other uh, uh, projects over time. So I think it all comes back to the manifesto, and I love this version of the manifesto by Alexei Kravitsky. Blah 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 blah. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's really, I think Martin brought this out yesterday. That key part, software is produced by people. It's, in, it's an individual creative activity. Teams and people create software. And that's what this is all about. That's, I think that's one of the problems that a lot, a lot of organizations get into uh, when they get into um, distributed teams, they get into to, uh, outsourcing and offshore work, is they think it's all about replaceable cogs. It's not about replaceable cogs. It's about empowered teams and individuals that can get their job done. So if we look long ago and far away, let's take an example, a couple of different examples of how distributed teams could work. So here we have one where we've got a management project review. The outside, you, you come, come in to, the management comes in to see how the project is going at the distributed team. Dispense with the pleasantries, Commander. I'm here to put you back on schedule. I assure you, Lord Vader, my men are working as fast as they can. Perhaps I can find new ways to motivate them. I tell you, this station will be operational as planned. The Emperor does not share your optimistic appraisal of the situation. But he asks the impossible. I need more men. Then perhaps you can tell him when he arrives. Empress coming here? That is correct, Commander. And he is most displeased with your apparent lack of progress. We shall double our efforts. I hope so, Commander, for your sake. The Emperor is not as forgiving as I am. So let's compare that against a, another uh, remote team and see, how, see what happened with them. Yeah, no.
Back door, huh? Good idea. It's only a few guards. This shouldn't be too much trouble. Well, only takes one to sound the alarm. Then we'll do it real quiet like. Oh, oh my! The Princess Leia! I'm afraid our furry companion has gone and done something rather rash. Oh, no. There goes our surprise attack. We shall stay here. So you see that? A couple of things. You know, the Ewoks, they worked in pairs. They uh, arranged things. They, they uh, took initiative. They took ownership. And the most important thing is they made the manager decide that it was his idea. So that was, that was all good. And so uh, building off what Martin had to say yesterday, I, I realized that what this is all about is moving from coding monkeys to empowered Ewoks. This is what we need to, teams need to be able to be empowered. And so how do we get to the point where teams are empowered and have the ownership? This is a model uh, a friend of mine, Paul Gibson, uh, has put together. Uh, I really love it. It's, it's, the idea is that if you're looking at a team and how they're working, how is their ownership? How is the team owning the problem? Do they have a high ownership or a low ownership? And then how is the leadership and management working with this? Are they controlling the team or are they trusting the team? If it's a controlling environment then, and the, uh, the team has no ownership, we're in effectively a command and control mode. You know, leaders are trying to take control and the team can't take ownership, so it's command and, command and control. Uh, when the team tries to take ownership, but the leader won't, will still try to take control, they generate a conflict between the leader and the team. And when the leader says, okay, I trust you to take, take this on, and the team doesn't take ownership, the leader has effectively abdicated, the team has effectively abdica abdicated, and there's no ownership. And where we really want to get to is where the team has ownership and leaders have trusted them to get their job done. Then they can be empowered, then they have energy and innovation. So the question is, how do we get there? Again, it all, I think it all comes back to people. First, you've got to get the right people. You've got to have the right people that have the passion, the ability, and, the organ and, and then have organizational fit. And if they're in that center point, you've got the right material for developing empowered teams. But you might have the passion, like maybe I have the passion to be a Bollywood actor, but I don't have the ability, so it's not going to work very well. Or I may not have the organizational fit, it just doesn't work. But when I've got all those coming together, then that works. So recently, in fact, uh, I left Halliburton Landmark, and it was largely because but originally my passion and ability and organizational fit where I was really focused on reservoir simulation, I had a lot of passion around that, has shifted. So my passions have shifted over time to be a little bit more around general software engineering. Uh, my abilities have stayed about, you know, I've probably gotten less able to do some of the detailed work. Uh, and then the organizational fit. I, was, I found that, that over time Halliburton had drifted towards more of an environment that wasn't quite a great place, great wonderful company to work for. It wasn't the one that fit my organ. It wasn't a fit with, with what I was looking for. IHS provided that organizational fit. Um, you know, IHS is a great company. A promo for IHS. Uh, IHS is a company that delivers data, and, uh, information, and analytics to a broad uh, aspect of the, organ of, the, of the world. We deal with almost all the Fortune uh, 500 companies. We're global. We're making analytics decisions, dealing with everything. We've got a great organizational fit. And we have an office here in Bangalore, and we're hiring. So come see us at the job fair. It's my commercial. The other thing we need to do is we need to get alignment on the purpose. We need to, if you're aligned with the purpose, that's the only way the team can actually own it. The, the team, we need to know what the purpose of the organization is, and we need to have the team own that purpose. Uh, types of po powerful questions are, you know, what are we building? Uh, what business are we in? 
Uh, too often, what I see, the question we ask is, what building are we in? <laughs> Not as useful. So here's a model that uh, my book partner, Neil Nicolaisen, uh, has come up with. I really love it because I think it's a really simple model of, and clarifies some issues very quickly. We're looking at, from the organizational perspective, where's our market differentiation? What are places where we have a high market differentiation versus low market differentiation? And where are places where it's mission critical, both to us as an organization and to our customers? When we have low market differentiation and, and low mission criticality, we're in this who care categories. At that point, we're trying to minimize or eliminate what we're doing. On the other hand, when we're in the differentiating category, high, mission, high market differentiation and high mission criticality, that's the place where we're creating sustainable competitive advantage. We want to innovate and create. There's some cases where we have low market differentiating, but it's still mission critical. For example, a payroll system. You're not going to go to your customers and say, come buy our widgets because we have the world's best payroll system. Right? Do they care? In fact, they probably prefer you don't pay people or you don't have, have the best accounts receivable package. Right? But your employees care. So it's mission critical to your, to your employees. It's not mission critical or it's not uh, differentiating in the marketplace. In that case, we're trying to achieve and maintain parity. We try to mimic and simplify. We look for off-the-shelf solutions. We look for open source solutions. Whatever out there, what our competitors are doing, we're trying to mimic that and do just, what they're, just about the same thing that they're doing. And then the last case where we've got uh, a market differentiating, but it may not be mission critical we're involved in it, uh, we're looking to see what sort of partnerships might we, we create. What I love about this is it's applicable at a corporate strategy level, a product strategy level, even down to the feature level. Development teams can be looking at, at their products and their features and, and say, where do we fit in this? If, if a feature is, is something that's a parity type feature, I don't want to be gold plating it. I want to be doing the least possible and moving on. If it's something that's mission critical, I want to say, how can that make a difference to our customers? How can it be even more uh, market differentiating if it's, if it's up there? We can look at this. For example, uh, looking at Apple, how might Apple fit in this category? So what do they have that's in the differentiating category? Well, new product design, user experience, content distribution with iTunes. These are the types of things that Apple is really focused on. Now we'll see whether the new, new product design is one that's sustainable for them. They haven't come out with a lot really creative and innovative for a few years, and some other people have moved past them. So we'll see what the, whether they're able to, to push on with the new level there. Uh, in the parity category, they made deals with Microsoft to make sure they had Microsoft Office on the Mac. Uh, they switched over to Intel hardware. That was parity decision. Uh, a lot of other software is down there in the parity area. With partnership, when they went, uh, came out with the iPhone, at least in the US, they made a strategic partnership with AT&T at first in order to capture market. They could capture value through that partnership. They didn't have to go create a network, a, a communication network. They could use an existing communication network, create a differentiated partnership, and make a lot of money on that. Now over time, they said, well, that, that, that moved down into the parity, and they started working with all other vendors. But at least that was something that they could look at for a short period of time. And then who cares? They got out of, uh, they were once very big in the printer space. They got out of that, so peripheral. So this is a, a quick example of how this can be used. I think it's a simple model that can help create a lot of clarity within uh, organizations and teams. Once you get to that purpose, then you're looking at, well, what else do you need to do in order to get ownership? What's, what's, that, uh, what's that key? I'm going to step back and, sit and, and give an example here of, of uh, this beyond just that, but also uh, the idea of how we use feedback and how feedback can help us get there. So this is a, a, a video by John Cleese, John Cleese of Monty Python fame or for the younger generation, nearly headless Nick in uh, uh, the Harry Potter series. John Cleese, back in the 80s, did some uh, management videos. And this management video, to me, is one of the best, best, uh, indicator, or the best view of what agile development is really about. Gordon, the guided missile, sets off in pursuit of its target. It immediately sends out signals to discover if it's on course to hit that target. And, and the signals come back. No, you are not on course, so change it up a bit and slightly to the left. And Gordon changes course as instructed, and then rational little creature that he is, he sends out another signal. Am I on course now? And back comes the answer, no. 
But if you adjust your present course a little bit, a little bit further up, and a little bit further to the left, then you will be. So he adjusts his course again and sends out another request for information. And back comes the answer. No, Gordon, you still got it wrong. You must come down a bit and a foot to the right. And the guided missile, its rationality and persistence, a lesson to us all, goes on and on making mistakes and on and on listening to the feedback and on and on correcting its behavior in the light of that feedback until it blows up the nasty enemy thing. <laughs> then we applaud the missile for its skill. And then if some critic says, well, it made a lot of mistakes on the way, we reply, yes, but that didn't matter, did it? It got there in the end. All its mistakes were little ones in the sense that they could be immediately corrected. And as a result of making hundreds of mistakes, eventually, the missile succeeded in avoiding the one mistake which would really have mattered, missing the target. So when you're thinking about your software project, are you hitting the release, are you hitting what your customers really need? Not hitting what your customers really need would be, a mis would be missing the target. So that's the whole point about feedback, is feedback is so critical to the agile development process. And it's feedback is how we get that ownership. So let me go through, uh, being a chemical engineer, you know, when I saw that video, I said, wow, that's, that's really control systems. You know, in the in chemical engineers deal a lot with control systems and process controls. And one of the things that we learned uh, in, chemical in the chemical engineering world and chemical, proce chemical processing plants uh, is that there's two different approaches to control systems. One where, you know, basically the model is the same. We've got inputs, we've got processes, and we've got outputs. And one way to focus on this is we could look largely at the inputs and the processes. And when we're looking at inputs and processes, we're predominantly in a command and control mode. In the chemical engineering world, when you're looking at, at inputs and processes, there's something called feed forward. You're trying to look at the inputs and make your projections going forward. It turns out that's a very, very unstable mode for chemical processing plants, learned in, in the chemical engineering world. It's just unstable. Much more stable is instead the focus on outputs. Looking at outputs, being on feedback, and adjusting. And to me, this is where agile leadership is really the shift. It's moving from command and control, from input, from focuses on inputs and processes, which auditors love. Auditors love being able to look at inputs and processes because they can checkbox those. But they never look at outputs. Why don't they look at outputs? Because it's not easy to checkbox. But as software engineers and as teams, we really want to focus on outputs. Are we delivering and are we getting close to what the, the end user wants? Are we meeting our customer objectives? To the extent we're focusing on outputs, and to the extent we're, we're bringing feedback to the system and adjusting the system accordingly, that's where the difference makes. So this is the real shift. And what I see in this shift, if we look back at this trust and ownership model, what often has to happen is we need to take shifts in an incremental mode. So if we're looking at how to get there, it turns out from control system perspective, the only stable zones of control are along the diagonal. Because if we're over in conflict, in a high, high conflict area, it, it's not sustainable. Eventually the team will burn out. The team will burn out and they say, okay, I give up. I tried to take ownership, They're not, the, owner, the leader's not letting me take ownership, therefore I'm gonna let the leader take over because it's just burning me out and it reverts to command and control. If we're over on the other side we're in tr where the leader trusts them, the team doesn't own anything, they don't deliver anything, eventually somebody finds out. And when they find out, they say, well, nothing's getting done here, they're just playing. So there's, the trust goes away, and that's not a stable model either. But along the zone of stable control, we can move up and down that diagonal. And how we move up and down that, down that diagonal, what I see is that oftentimes what has to happen is we have to take that increment, we have to work in an incremental mode. The team can start, so the team can take the action, or the leader can provide some of the action. In this case, the team might take some action. I'll own a little bit. I'll own a little bit. I'll demonstrate results. By demonstrating the results, sometimes that can result in the leader providing more trust, and then over time, we can move up that, that line. Alternatively, we can take small steps by leaders providing uh, additional trust, providing more focus on purpose and ownership, and the team can start taking us. If you try to take too big of a jump on this, uh, I think oftentimes it becomes unstable. But eventually you can get up there, you can get up into that energy and innovation, and that ownership. You've gotta have the ownership, you've gotta have accountability. So when I look back at 
why might, when have I had really successful uh, empowered distributed teams, it's always been when that team has autonomy, they've got local leadership, they've got the local domain knowledge that is critical to be able to understand the business problem, they've got complete test, the developer team, test team, everything necessary to own a particular sub-piece of the problem. So they've owned it, they deliver it, they can take ownership, and we trust them to deliver. When we move away from that, the teams are very, very much less um, effective. So then let's look at some of the challenges that, that I've experienced in dealing with um, outsourcing and distributed teams. One of the big ones, particularly because of the industry uh, I'm in, is proprietary data. I mean, our, our partners are very large oil companies. Uh, their properties are worth a lot. Their data is worth a lot. They're wor very worried about their data because they're in a competitive environment. Having that proprietary data outside of our hands, they're very sometimes reluctant to give it to us in the first place, but when they are, they want it under very strict control. So oftentimes they're not willing to let it to an outsourcing partner. They might even let, let it outside of our uh, immediate office. A big challenge, particularly in our, our area. I've talked to a few people from other industries. Uh, they say they have the same problem because of, uh, of uh, the type of data that's very sensitive data. Our approach to that has been uh, one of trying to synthesize data. Uh, it, it works okay. It's not great. It's a limiting factor in how much we can uh, enable other outsourcing teams to do. But uh, so it's just one of those challenges. You know about it. Uh, another challenge, of course, is time shift. Uh, we had a 12-hour time shift uh, between Vietnam and Houston, uh, eight hours between um, Romania and Houston. It turned out in this case, we actually, well, we looked at the whole system and they said, yes, we have a time shift distance, and yes, it makes some issues on communication. What can we do about it? Right? So one of the things we did is we said, well, what if we change some of our build time, some of our, our Houston build time, and we made it so the Vietnam team would have a build ready for themselves that they could run the automation test during their day. Once they were done with it, with the automation test, they didn't have the knowledge to go into the detailed engineering to figure out whether the tests were false, false tests or, or real shit. So we had to have additional analysis work done, which was done by our petroleum engineers in Romania. So we, when the automation test finished, the Romania team picked it up, they did the engineering analysis, and then by the time the Houston warning was gone, going on, we would have the results from the Romanian team and we would know whether uh, we had a build that was worth, uh, that was successful and, and uh, something that could take even uh, deeper, deeper testing. So we actually turned things around and said, yes, we've got a problem, but also how can we utilize it? Uh, we also took advantage of the fact that we had, the, the, Romani the Romanian team was up, uh, uh, eight hours, eight hour difference makes it very easy to have at least a couple hours of overlap. Uh, then they were actually have, but they overlap as well with the uh, Vietnamese team. So they became an intermediary in some cases in some of the communications. So we were able to turn it out, and in this case, work, it worked out quite well for us. So yes, it's a challenge. Yes, it's a pain in the ass trying to deal with and having meetings during the night, during the day, during the early mornings. Um, eventually, you can make it, make it work out. Another challenge, xenophobia. So this, is, this is one of my Houston developers, pickup truck and gun. You know, so, you know, people, I tell people all the time, distributed outsourcing, offshore teams, it's a real challenge. It's challenging. If somebody wants to make it fail, it's real easy. It's real easy to make it fail. You want to make it work, you've got to put the work into it, right? And we're going to have some, you're going to encounter people that just don't want to make it work. They have, they have fear about something. They fear about losing their job. They, have, they just are, are persnickety and they don't, you know, they don't want to have to deal with the, uh, the, the challenges of dealing with it, it will happen. We have to identify that. You have to figure out how do we get around that? What do you do about it? You know, but it's reality. And here's one that's particularly, I think, of, uh, of issue culturally with, uh, within India uh, is transparency and honesty. Right? Uh, there are cultural issues. We're dealing, I know in, in India it's often difficult to get all the team members to feel like they can communicate as a team, as, a, as an individual member to, to the remote, everything has to go through the leader. Too much hierarchy introduced has issues dealing with uh, transparency. Uh, honesty, sometimes teams feel like they need to tell what people want to hear rather than what uh, uh, is truly happening. 
It's all about honesty. I mean, teams can only be effective if there's transparency and honesty. Uh, I have a big issue. After dealing with, with so many Indian vendors over the years, I have come to finally one realization. I've been able to figure out uh, when an Indian uh, vendor sales rep is lying to me. You know how? Their lips are moving. It's just, you know, it's, it's not quite that bad, but it seems, it, sometimes it seems that way, right? Is it just, we can't get straight answers, and it's so frustrating trying to deal with it, because we're trying to all be in the same game. We're trying to all do the right thing, and when we're not getting the right feedback, once you break that feedback loop, the whole premise of what we're doing is broken. Feedback has to be honest, it has to be transparent. You know, sometimes I'll tell my teams, you know, the feedback has to be I say ruthless. Now, I don't necessarily mean as ruthless as my picture's going to be, but your code, it sucks. I mean, you can still be nice. You can still have respect. But if we're, getting, if we're not getting what we need from the remote teams, we need to let them know. We need to give the feedback so they get better. Right? And we need to get to the point where our remote teams are telling our, our US and European-based teams that their code isn't up to par. Right? That's the level we need to get to to the point where there's real partnership, there's real ownership across the board. That transparency and honesty and respect is key. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges I see from a cultural perspective dealing with uh, uh, groups in India. Great talent, great talent all around, but that transparency is a, is a key issue. And, I, and it's a different. Dealing with Eastern Europe, for example, uh, they're very transparent. You know, they'll, they'll come and get in our face and tell us, no, you gotta do things differently. And it's really, it's really a healthy exchange. So I think that's one of the shifts that, that uh, will make a big difference uh, and, a, and a change that really, really matters in, in being effective. So some of the key takeaways um, from a software quality perspective, you know, always try to build quality in. You can't test quality in. You gotta build it in. You gotta find and correct the defects early to reduce uncertainty. Otherwise you're pushing that uncertainty all to the end. Look at what your testing strategies are, right? How are you testing? So many teams that I work with, they don't even know what their testing strategy is. They just sort of make it up on the fly. What really helped for us was analyzing our situation, doing thinking, using our brains a little bit, and figuring out where are our challenges, what can we do about it? You, know, you won't necessarily have the same problem, but if you, use, you, know, you look and analyze it, you can see what could you do about it. Don't just accept that it's a problem. A test automation is key uh, to maintaining velocity. But test automation does not replace exploratory testing. What we did, because we were able to do more test automation, it freed up our key petroleum engineers to be able to do the really hard problems with exploratory testing. And exploratory testing is where we find most of the problems. Right? The automation tests are just to make sure we're not introducing new things. Exploratory testing is really the key. So you, you still have a fair amount of manual testing, but those people are doing really hard testing. They're, doing, they're using the brains a lot rather than just manually uh, road, road activity. And uh, the thing we worked with with action-based testing did help us with uh, reducing test brittleness. So having an automation tool and, uh, that, that provided that abstraction was really good and, and knowing how to do it. Uh, a couple of takeaways on distributed teams. Sure, distributed can, teams can be very effective. I think I've, I've worked with a large number of them and most of my teams have been effective. But as I say, it's really easy to make it not work if your teams don't want it to work. The key to me was autonomy and feedback. It's critical to building trust and ownership. We need to treat outsour you know, I tell a lot of people, you treat your outsourcer as a partner, you'll get much better results. If we're all in the game the same, it makes a big difference. Uh, I see distributed teams are real, reality. Um, having everyone in one room is great, but I think it's distributed teams are, are a reality. Um, it's a way to leverage global talent. The key is being able to make those distributed teams all act as independent units, that are, that, uh, as loosely coupled as possible, and then uh, come together for the global good. One thing I think, think globally and optimize the whole. I mean, look like what we did with, with our um, uh, timeline. We had, to, we had to change some of our practices once we looked at the overall global situation. So we changed our build times in order to take advantage of the situation. In many teams I had that we were just stuck. Well, we, this doesn't work because we have this set time. Well, have you thought about changing it? You know, think about it globally. If you're thinking about the whole situation, ask the question, what could we do to improve? And things will you know, be able to change. If you're stuck and it has to be this way, you won't get there. So my contact, uh, this is my book, Stand Back and Deliver, a um, couple of emails, at, and uh, get towards empowered Ewoks. They're so cute and they're so powerful. May the force be with you. All right? Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Right
Yeah. So the investment in this case was um, was pretty much the incremental team. So the incremental team was the the six developers developer testers in Romania, as well as the four automation testers in uh, Vietnam. Uh, Certainly, that was a lot cheaper than trying to add a similar number of people to our Houston team. And in fact, we might not have even be able to find the talent in the Houston area. So um, as a relative investment, I don't know, we were at, that was adding about uh, 10, to, 10 people to 30, but it was probably well less than, than, than half. So it was a relatively small incremental investment. And, and we also had some incremental, in, we, we took people off of some things that they were doing in Houston and also had them refocus as well. So, so I think overall, it, uh, we felt that it was a, a clear win, right? A huge reduction with, with something we felt like we had to do in order to get our velocity up. So, so yeah, it was an investment, but it was, it was uh, not a huge investment. And the fact that we were able to leverage global talent made it much less of an investment. Yeah, I believe you have investment in tools. And yeah, and the tools were something that came, uh, the, because we were using the, the vendor in Vietnam and, we, and because it was part of a larger engagement that we had, they provided the tool for free. So that was actually part of their in, engagement. That, worked, that was one of the reasons we worked with that, that vendor. Yeah. We think about the challenges of proprietary data yeah. and also to test you know, high performance clusters. My question is that how do you stimulate them in a non-part environment? Because your production setup may have a very high end system which involves a lot of cost. Did you try to simulate as this environment is not hard, or did you apply something like a cut down version and then a kind of faster to, uh, to say what the results will be in production? Because otherwise, there will be a huge investment to have a not hard as well as hard environment at the same scale and time. Yeah, so, so we're a product company. So as a product company, we have a limited number of test environments that we use, and then we strip it out to the world, and, we, and they have any number of test environment, you know, production environments. So we don't have a control over what production is. What we, all we can do is say, can we simulate it, and is it, is it good enough? Uh, so we had predict, we, and you can't afford a large number of high-performance computing clusters. They're, they're pretty expensive. So we had one high-performance computing cluster that was fairly standard, and uh, uh, actually we had two. We had a, a Linux version, and we had a, a Windows version. Uh, at that time, it was Linux was the predominant uh, high-performance computing cluster that we were working with, but we did have a smaller Windows cluster as well. Um, so we had two, and that was sufficient. We felt like just from a hardware perspective, that was sufficient to, in, environments to test on. Uh, the bigger challenges is the collection of data that we run through it, because that's where, where our challenges were. And, and that's where we had all the customer data. We had a, you know, a good collection, probably 30, 40, really, really hard customer problems. We had, you know, 500 to 1,000 simple data, simple models that we had the developers working with. It was the creation of this middle area, which we created about 100 or so intermediate problems, and that was all synthetic data. And then those models could be run anywhere, and they didn't need to run on a high-performance compute cluster because they were small enough that they could run, so, so they could be run remotely uh, you know, on a mini high-performance, you know, a four-processor, four eight-processor cluster, rather than needing a full 6,428 cluster, node cluster. So it was a matter of finding where, what we could do, because our Romania team could buy reasonable hardware that wasn't, wasn't too expensive. And they were able to, to simulate some of the environment. Uh, and the, uh, I think, uh, as well, the Vietnam, the, the tests that the, the were going on in the, in the Vietnam were more at the user interface level. And so they were doing the, 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 the computational part was very minor, but the, it was more hitting the user interface pieces. How did you leverage the benefits to that? So, so how did we come up with a strategy? We got a bunch of people in our room. We said, what's our challenges and what could we do about it? And, and then and that was mostly our Houston team. So our, our team got together, got together with the QA manager. Uh, my team was the development team, a QA manager. We got together with the product team. And we said, where are the challenges? What could we do about it? And we, and we came to a conclusion that we needed to, to, we needed to look at what our strategy was, where our, our gaps were, and when we found where our gaps were, we said, what could we invest in, and how much do we take out of our existing team in Houston to put into that effort, how much can we leverage offshore talent, and then how much offshore, how, how we use the uh, 
team in Vietnam to do the GUI automation. So that was sort of what came together with that. Combination there also was, was thinking about what we wanted to do and opportunities finding the right vendors that, that were able to provide those, those gaps, fill, filling in those gaps. And, uh, yes? I was having trouble hearing that. So uh, you represented the ownership model two by two grid. Oh, okay, the two, um, yeah, okay. So my question is with respect to how you went about determining where the organization is placed as a whole uh, yeah. in the respective grids, and was there any method that you adopted to determine what our strategy is to take us to the to B grid? Yeah, I, I think, so the interesting there is I didn't know about the ownership model when, I, when these teams were formed, so it was sort of a retrospect afterwards. This is something that I've learned about uh, more or less in the last year. But it explained to me so much what time, when I've seen success has been exactly that. So I think for us what it was, with our two, team, two remote teams, I think our, our Romania team was really successful because they knew our domain, uh, they knew exactly what they're responsible for, and they were able to deliver on it. And they knew that it, if they didn't deliver, they weren't, you know. And the good thing there was we were probably willing to cut more slack than the owner of the, the Romania company was. So we were going to, you know, this is a new partnership, but he was on top of it. He wanted them to be successful from the first day. And so he really created an environment where, where output was important. So he made sure that they delivered. And when they delivered, we gave them more. And, the more, and, and they, they were able to trust and they got more efficient. So that worked really well. Uh, Again, I think the same thing happened with the Vietnamese team. The Vietnamese team had a very specific piece that they owned, and they had the talent and experience to be able to own that. So by doing that, then they could own it, they could produce the outputs, and we had regular feedback with them on a, on a regular basis, daily basis, uh, as necessary to provide that. So it was the feedback loops, it was the, and, and taking the ownership, and petitioning it so that they could, could in fact own it. Trusting them to do it, and getting them to own it. Oh, yes. Uh, can you, yeah, please. I presume you had the uh, global problem of barely any requirements. So how did you uh, distribute it with the global team? Uh, the varying requirements? Yeah. yeah. So varying requirements, uh, sure, absolutely. I mean, the key part there was the uh, regular communication with both teams. Uh, and to the extent possible, we would keep what they owned as compartmentalized and, and uh, structured so that what they provided, I mean, they were working on a piece that we didn't expect to change. So it was a small timeline that they were all working on so that it didn't change during the time. And if they were going to change, we'd get right back to them and say, okay, you're working on that, but we don't want you to do that anymore. Typically that didn't happen because we knew what they, we needed teams to do. And uh, most of the churn in this case probably was dealt with at the, uh, at the local level, but it was ne we were never in an environment where the churn was that fast. The churn would tend, tend to be things that we needed to account for and we need to be looking for. So the, the management team needed to be having the foresight to say, yes, we agree that there's a change coming, but we're not going to have to just deal with this change today. You know, as a product company, typically we're looking at a, at a release cycle, and that release cycle, we've got usually some time to navigate through it. So, so yes, there's some change, but we don't have to have that change happen immediately. Unless it's something where you know, they had to be pulled into some maintenance activity or some emergency demo or something like that, which does always happen in a product company. But typically we dealt with that with the local team. Tried to isolate that. Any other questions? All right.